uh, from William Patterson University uh, on sabbatical at Rutgers uh, this year, who will speak on minimal examples of non kuzul uh, a gamma. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Um, so, like I was saying before, I'm going to explain what it means to be a causal algebra, and that's going to be a big part of the talk. As a matter of fact, the first half of the talk is just going to be some definitions. So we need to get through a little bit of graph theory, and then a little bit of general algebra, and then I'm going to introduce two algebras, and then we could talk about this result. So we're going to start off with uh, directed graphs, where the vertices can be parti partitioned into what we're going to call layers. Um, we're going to use the standard norm symbol to denote the layer of a vertex. And we have two definitions if we do that. We're going to have a generalized layer graph, which is a graph where the tails are always in a higher layer than the head. And we're going to have a layered graph, which is one where the tails are exactly one layer higher than the head. And it's a little easier to see with a picture like this. A layered graph would be something where, does this have a, a beam on it too? Ooh, it's very nice. Uh, so a layered graph would be something where the tails are always one layer higher, and a generalized layered graph could have edges of length 2 or length 3, or and so on. Uh, for most of the talk, we're going to be talking about layered graphs, though some of the results I'm going to be talking about do hold for generalized layered graphs as well. Uh, so one important class of layered graphs that we're going to be talking about are the uh, Boolean lattice of subsets of... Uh, what's the difference yes. between a layered graph and a partially ordered set? Ah, so the difference is in like a post set, like let's say we were to make, ah, let's say we were to make this into a post set. Well, this is bigger than this, and this is bigger than this. So then in the post set, we'd have this is bigger than this. But in the graph, we actually have the edges. So we have an edge relation between this and this, but no relation between this and this. So and that's the no difference there. Also. So right, we're not assuming transitivity. We just have these edges between vertices. But we're actually going to be looking at these graphs as post sets because these are going to be the hash graphs of post sets. Yeah. And so we're going to be going back and forth throughout the talk. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to get to post sets in two slides. But yeah. OK. And um, the Boolean lattice is actually usually thought as a post set, thought of as a post set, not as a layered graph. But we could think about it as either one. And I guess I'll introduce both. So what you can do is you can take the subset relation between any two sets and say, a is less than b whenever a is a subset of b. So in that sense, say this element 2 would be less than this element 1, 2, 3. But if I want to make this into a layered graph, all I have to do is say we're going to draw an edge from a to b whenever b happens to be a subset of size 1 less. So that's how we get a layered graph. And we can go, we can look at this, and we will be looking at this as both a layered graph and as a post set at different times. Ah, and this is what I was just saying there. We can turn the graph into a post set by saying A is less than B whenever there's a path from B to A. And then in order to turn the post set back into the graph, we just take the hash graph of the post set. Okay, so one of the reasons we do want to look at these as post sets is we're going to want to take I chains inside them. So what is an I chain in one of these structures? Well, an I chain in a post set is an I plus one tuple of elements in ascending order. And one of the reasons that we're going to need these I chains is because we'd like to work with this Mobius function on a post set. As a matter of fact, the Mobius function is going to take in two elements of the post set. And what it's going to do is it's going to be the alternating sum of the number of chains. So we're going to count the number of zero chains, the number of one chains, the number of two chains, and just do plus, minus, plus, minus down the line. And let's do some examples of these things. So suppose we wanted the three chains in B3. Well, the only way to get a three chain would be to start with a minimal and end with a maximal element. And then these are sort of these darkened in vertices here are showing you where those chains would be. Now, if we wanted two chains, there'd be a bunch more of them because we're not requiring that we start in the minimal and end in the maximal element. But these would be the two chains for B3. And let's do an example with the Mobius function as well. For example, let's go back to B2. And let's try to take the Mobius function from the minimal to the maximal element in B2. Um, well, in order to do this, we have to count the two chains, the one chains, and the zero chains. So for the two chains, we need these paths with two steps. So we could go here, here, or here, here. There's just two of them. For one chain now, because we're going from the minimal to the maximal element, we do have to start here and end here. So there's just one one chain. And there's no zero chains. You would have to start and end with the same element in order to get to a zero chain. 
So we have no zero chains, one one chain, and two two chains, and we're taking an alternating sum. So that would give us a Mobius function of one. Okay, another graph theory definition we're going to need is that of an up-down sequence. So two vertices of the same layer, L, are going to be connected by an up-down sequence if there happens to be a sequence of vertices all of the same layer with the following property. Given any two of these vertices in sequence, there are edges leaving them that happen to have a common head. So basically it's called an up-down sequence. It probably should be called a down-up sequence, but it's called an up-down sequence because you can go down, up, down, up, down, up, and get to the other one. And all of these, of course, have to be at the same level. Okay, and the reason we want that definition is for the definition of uniform graph. And this is going to be important because we're going to be dealing with a class of algebras based on graphs, and those graphs are going to need to be uniform in order for those algebras to be quadratic. So, a layered graph is uniform if for any pair of edges with a common tail, their heads are connected by an up-down sequence that lies below that common tail. So, for this example here, we have two edges that have a common tail, and these heads are connected by an up-down sequence, but it's not connected by an up-down sequence of heads below that common tail. So because of that, this is not a uniform graph. However, this is uniform, not just because of this example, but because for any two edges that have a common tail, there's an up-down sequence between the heads of those edges, and the up-down sequence is below that common tail. And that gets us through the graph theory definitions we're going to need in this talk. We also want some algebra definitions as well. And we're going to start off with uh, the tensor algebra. So suppose we have a finite dimensional vector space. Uh, we set a basis E1 through EN, let's say. And the tensor algebra then is just going to be the free K algebra generated by those basis elements. We can construct this in case anyone's not familiar with it. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to take v to the 0 to be a copy of our field, and we're going to need a basis element for that. I'm going to call my basis element 1, because this basis element is going to be the identity in the algebra that I'm constructing. So that's v to the 0. Now for v to the i, what we're going to do is we're going to take v tensored with itself i times. So what does that mean? Well, you could think of that as taking words in our basis element, or in our basis elements, that happen to have length i, and then taking all linear combinations of such words. So all linear combinations of words with letters that are equal to our basis elements that happen to have length i. And that's how we form v to the i. And then once we do that, we take the direct sum of all the v to the i in order to form a vector space t to the v. But I want to call this thing an algebra. So because I want to call this thing an algebra, I have to define a product. So we're going to define this product bit by bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off defining this map from vi to vj, I mean from vi cross vj to vi plus j, and here's how we're going to do it. Simplest way possible. If we have a single word in v to the i, and we want to multiply that times a single word in v to the j, we just take the two words and pop them right next to each other and make it into one word of v to the i plus j. And then let's say we have a linear combination of words in v to the i, and a linear combination of words in v to the j. Well, we just extend that linearly and distribute over to get what that product is. And as a matter of fact, we can have a sum of words in different vi's and different vj's and just extend that linearly, and then we have our product defined on the entire space except for v to the 0, but that's the easiest part. Because all we're going to do is we're going to allow the identity times any word to be that word itself, whether or not the identity is on the right or the left. So from this we get this nice algebra and some simple examples. Let's say you have a word xy, and you have a word zy, and you want to put them together, you get xy, zy. Or if you have 3 times our identity times, say, x plus 2y, well, you just distribute over, and you get 3x plus 6y. And you can do this with longer words. That's not a very long word, but you can do this with, with words of any length, just by distributing over everything. Um, OK. And this is the big definition we're going to get into talk, because Hilda's name comes from Hilbert series. Um, so Hilbert series are very important for this result, and um, the algebras we're going to be dealing with, they happen to be infinite dimensional. 
So if you say, what's the size of your algebra? That's not very interesting. The answer is always going to be infinity. So what we have is we have something called a Hilbert series, which is a way of counting the sizes. We're going to break our algebra down into different graded pieces, and we're going to measure the size of each of those pieces. So that's why we need the following definition. So if V happens to be any vector space, that's a direct sum of finite dimensional vector spaces that's indexed over the natural numbers, what we can do is we can form a formal power series and allow the coefficient of t to the i to just be the dimension of vi. So it's a formal power series, and here's an example. Suppose we start off with a one-dimensional vector space with basis just x. So we have a one-dimensional vector space, that means v to the 1 is just x. And v to the 2 is, all, is going to be all the words of length 2 in our basis elements. There's just one word, xx. So v to the 2 is just going to be the span of xx, v to the 3 is going to be the span of xxx, v to the 4 is going to be the span of xxxx. All these dimensions are going to be 1, all these, all these vector spaces are 1 dimensional, so you put them together and we can write that as 1 over 1 minus t. Okay, suppose we want to construct the symmetric algebra on two variables and take the Hilbert series. So for a simple example, but not quite as simple as the one we just had. So now we're going to start off with, and this is an algebra that people are familiar with. Suppose uh, we want to construct this. We're going to start off with two basis elements, x and y. We're going to take the tensor algebra, and then we're going to set i to be the ideal generated by x tensor y minus y tensor x, or x y minus y x. And this ideal is nice because of, a num well, because of a number of reasons. One reason is that it just has one relation that we're generating by. But also, notice that this is a degree 2 word, and this is a degree 2 word. So it's not like we're setting a degree 5 word to be equal to a degree 1 word or something like that. We're not going to be changing where these things are, or we're not going to be mapping things around as much as we could. And what we're going to end up is we're going to take the smallest ideal that contains this element, or this element, if we want to think about it like that, and we mod up by that ideal to get the symmetric algebra in two variables. But let's say we wanted to find the Hilbert series of that. Well, there's something called the Diamond Lemma, which gives us the Hilbert series of a non-associative algebra uh, constructed with, by, by a presentation on generators and relations, just like this algebra was. Um, so, Notice that a relation is a difference of two monomials of degree 2. And we actually have a special name for this, because algebras where the relations all have degree 2, uh, they have some very nice properties, including the causal property that we're going to be discussing. So we're going to have a special name for this. We're going to call such an algebra quadratic. Um, what we're going to do then is we're going to decide on an ordering of our generators. We're going to say, say that y is bigger than x. So it's not yes. commutative, but it's Yes. It is associative because of the way that multiplication was defined. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and if anyone wants to ask questions at any time, feel free, because there's a lot of definitions. So, um, at this point, we're then going to decide on an ordering of our generators. So, say y is bigger than x, and notice that we can replace an in instance of y x with x y because x y minus y x is zero, and that's what we want to do. So we're going to write this as a reduction, and whenever we see a yx, we're going to replace that with an xy. Now, this is very nice because yx doesn't overlap with itself. What do I mean by that? Well, if I had xx, I'd have to worry about words like xxx. Maybe I want to reduce the first two x's or the second two x's. If I had a reduction like xyx, well, I could have xyx, and that would overlap with xyx in the word xyxyx. So the difficulty in finding the Hilbert series is always, well, it depends on how much these relations overlap with each other. This has no overlap at all. So we can just reduce. So we can just count the words that don't contain yx. So a basis for v to the i is going to be given by the i plus 1 monomials that don't contain yx. And what are they? Well, they're shown here. You can start with x and give any number of x's and then any number of y's as long as the total number of letters add up to i. And we can't go back to x once we've done a y. So we have i plus 1 monomials uh, in v to the i for a basis of v to the i. And what's this going to give us? Well, it's going to give us this for our Hilbert series. The coefficient here comes from that identity element. The coefficient here comes from two generators. And the coefficients here and onward come from the fact that there's i plus 1 monomials that don't contain yx. And then this generating function we can write as this. 
Okay, so now we can get to the algebras A gamma. And um, let's construct them. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a layered graph. So we're going to combine our graph definitions with our algebra definitions right now. We're going to start off with a layered graph gamma. And let V be the vector space that's the span of the edges. So the generators are going to be the edges in gamma. Uh, we're going to form the free algebra TV. Uh, and what we're going to do is, well, we need some relations. Otherwise, this isn't going to be very interesting. So here's how we're going to get our relations. There's going to be a whole collection of relations for any two paths that have the same starting and finishing vertices. So for any two paths that start in the same point and end in the same point, we're going to get a whole collection of relations. And here's how we're going to get it. For every such pair of paths, we're going to impose this relation here. And the order does matter, because we're in a non-commutative algebra here. So we're starting off with the first edge in the first path, the second edge in the first path, all the way to the kth edge in the first path. And that's going to be equal to t minus the first edge in the second path, t minus the first edge, the second edge in the second path, and so on. Now, here t is just a formal parameter. So t is just a placeholder that's going to tell us uh, what ends up getting set to what. And then we mod out by the ideal generated by all such relations, so all the relations for any pairs of paths with that property, and that gives us our algebra A gamma. So we have a lot of relations here. Uh, but if we multiply this out, we can actually write our relations like this. So because of what happens when you multiply this out, what we'd end up with is we'd end up with the sum of all the edges in the first path is equal to the sum of all the edges in the second path. And the sum of the product of any two edges in order in the first path is the sum of the product of any two edges in order in the second path. And so on down to the bottom where we get the product of all the edges in the first path in order. And that's equal to all the edges in the second path in order. Okay. So, oh, these algebras were first constructed by Gelfand, Retox, Sarkonic, and Wilson in 2003. And sort of in the style of Gelfand, he always says, start with the smallest non-trivial example. Well, I'm not sure. This one's kind of trivial. But it does have two paths, so you can get something out of it. So, let's start here. Let's go back to B2. There's one path here, and there's one path here. So, what we're going to do is we're going to label the edges, because the generators are edges. And we get t minus e1, t minus e2 is equal to t minus f1, t minus f2. And since there's only one way we can get two paths that begin and end with the same vertices, uh, all our relations are going to come from this one uh, expression. So when I multiply it out, I get this, which tells me that e1 plus e2 has to equal f1 plus f2. And e1 times e2 has to equal f1 times f2. And we're going to call the algebra to the algebra with these generators and relations Q2. Now why give this actually another name? We already have B2 and we have gamma and we have all these. Well, the whole algebra, this, the, uh, the whole idea behind A gamma came from these examples Qn, which come from the Boolean lattice, uh, Bn. And the reason for the importance of this is there's something called Vieta's theorem. So you have a polynomial, and usually you have the coefficients of a polynomial and you want to find the roots. But sometimes you have the roots of the polynomial and you want to find the coefficients. And you can do this up to a multiple uh, in, in the case where everything is nice uh, and commutative and happy. Uh, it's called commutative Vieta's theorem. Well, there's also something called non-commutative Vieta's theorem, where you start off with the roots and you're trying to get to the coefficients where you're in a non-commutative ring. And in non-commutative Vieta's theorem, there's some slack that goes on. And that slack is described by the relations in Qn. So that's where this all started. But then it, was realized that, then it was realized that everything is much simpler when you look at this in terms of an arbitrary A gamma instead of trying to prove things specifically for these algebras Qn. And a lot of results uh, were, were much nicer once this was done. So that's why I gave it a name. Yes? So um, because it's not commutative, the relations that we get between these E's and F's aren't just like that their um, symmetric polynomials are equal? Right. The E1, E2, I can't replace that with E2, E1. Okay. Is that's what you're asking, sort of. Yeah, but it, it, the, the set of relations that we get in general um, for like this path equals that path and they have the same length, that's not the same as saying um, the symmetric polynomials as, you know, we know them like the sums of them and then the products and stuff. Is it the same as saying that those are, the, those are equal? 
or no because of some commutivity reasons? So, I mean, the, the relations are always, you're, you're, gonna, you're going to, uh, you're not allowed to assume commutativity in these relations at any point. The order does matter. So you're going to be, you're going to be getting stuff that's going down the path always instead of up the path. Okay. 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 So let's find the Hilbert series of Q2. It's a, it's a short example. Um, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do a nasty little trick here. You see, with this relation, we're going to pretend one of these four generators just doesn't exist. We're going to replace all occurrences of F2 with E1 plus E2 minus F1, and that's going to get rid of one of our relations right off the bat, and it's going to simplify this or complicate that. In any case, we're going to have one quadratic relation. E1, E2 is equal to F1 times E1 plus E2 minus F1. So then we're going to have to choose an ordering in our generators. And we could make our lives hard. If we chose F1 as our biggest element, we'd have to worry about, because we'd have an F1 here and an F1 here, we'd have to worry about F1, 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 which we could reduce in the first two F1s, or we could reduce it in the second two F1s and get a mess. But if we choose, say, E1 is our biggest element, then we just get the one reduction shown here. So E1, E2 is equal to this thing here. And then we can just simply count the words of each length in E1, E2, and F1, where E1 does not precede E2. Because this doesn't overlap with itself, because you can't have an E1, E2 on top of an E1, E2. Well, this is just a, a simple counting problem, because if we want to find all the good words in this state, in this case, well, if we want the good words of length n, we have three choices for a first, uh, first generator and then the good words of length n minus 1, and then we have to subtract off the good words of n minus 2 because we have to subtract off the words that begin with e1, e2 following a good word. So, we get initial conditions of 1, once again, from so our... So yes. immediately preceding, you don't want e1 to be immediately before e2? Uh, right, we don't want e1 immediately, right, exactly. We don't want e1 immediately before e2. Right. Though in the commutative case, we would have to watch out for an E1 anywhere before E2 because we can match it up, right. But we're in non-commutative, so right, it's just immediately proceeding that we have to worry, worry about. And that's why we get the following recurrence relation. We get our initial conditions of 1 from that identity element that we created in V to the 0, and 3 from the number of generators that we have here, and we get this uh, as our Hilbert series when we solve the following recurrence relation with those initial conditions. Okay, but in general, finding the Hilbert series of A gamma is much, much harder than this. We only had one relation here, and in general, you have lots and lots of relations and things can get quite messy. Um, however, there is one theorem for finding the Hilbert series of A gamma proved for both layered graphs and generalized layered graphs by Retok, Sarkonik, and Wilson, or Retok and Wilson, and that comes back to the Mobius function. So what we can do is we can take the, mo the graded Mobius function of the entire layered graph, and here's how we would do that. It's going to be a formal power series again. But for the coefficient of t to the i, what we're going to do is we're going to take any two elements where the difference in the layers is i, and we're going to take the Mobius function of those two elements. We add them all up, and that gives us the graded Mobius function. And then if we have that, the theorem says that we can compute the Hilbert series of A gamma from this. And let's do an example. So for the graded Mobius function, if we want to find this, what we have to do is get the coefficient of t to the i by looking at all the different elements that are distance i apart in terms of their layers. And they do have to be comparable elements, too. v has to be strictly greater than or less than w. So earlier we computed in b2 the Mobius function from the minimal to the maximal element, and we got 1. So let's say we next want to get the coefficient of t to the 1. Well, in order to, that, to do that, we have to look at all vertices that are distance 1 apart. And we have this, 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 and this. And there's no zero change there be because they have to involve uh, two elements. And we get 1, 1 chain, just the edge. So we get minus 1 4 times. And then when we're dealing with the difference of layers is 0, well, there are these two, but they're not comparable. So we just have this, 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 and this, and we get 4. So we get 4 minus 4t plus t squared, which gives us the same thing when we plug that into the theorem. Okay. The algebra is B gamma, the final thing I need to define. So, um, 
But in order to define it, it's related to the dual algebra of A. So very quickly, A is an algebra given by generators and relations. So we have these relations in our algebra. What we could do is for each of the generators uh, in V, we could let ui be the, or for any generator in V, we could take the linear functional that sends that generator to 1 and all other generators to 0. So we're taking the dual vector space here. Okay, we could generate an algebra out of that, but we need some relations. So how are we going to do that? Well, if we have anything in V2, what we could do is we could apply something in W2, where W is the collection of linear functionals, and here's how. If we have something uh, that's, let's say, W1 tensored with W2, we want to apply that to something like V1 tensored with V2, we just apply it pointwise. We apply W1 to V1 and W2 to V2. And we, uh, so we have an action of W2 on V2. In order to get our relations for our new algebra, the dual algebra, we look at the span of all the functionals that um, annihilate every relation in our original algebra. So if our original algebra, algebra has a lot of relations, then W is not going to have so many, because there's not going to be a lot of stuff that annihilates everything. And if our original algebra has few relations, then our, our dual algebra is going to have lots of relations. And we use this to construct our uh, dual algebra, which we'll denote by A with an exclamation point like that. OK. If gamma is a uniform layered graph, then a gamma happens to be a quadratic algebra. Um, this is why uniformity is important, because we want our A gammas to be quadratic. Why do we want our A gammas to be quadratic? Well, then we can take the dual algebras using the construction we just had in the last slide. It turns out that if gamma has a unique minimal vertex, we're going to get to a really easy algebra here called B gamma. Uh, if gamma has a unique minimal vertex of layer 0, then by taking the dual, like we just did, not of the algebra itself, but of the algebra when we tweak at it a little bit. We, we do something called take an associated graded algebra. So we pick out the unpleasant parts of the algebra, make it easier, and then take the dual of that. And we get a really pretty algebra called B gamma. Why would we want to do this? We're deforming the original algebra and taking a dual. Well, here's why. The algebras have the same Hilbert series as the actual dual of A gamma and really nice relations. How nice? Well, so nice that we can write it just like that. So the generators of this algebra are just the vertices above that minimal vertex. And if we want to find out what the products are, well, here are our relations. u times w is 0 if there's no edge from u to w. So the only way that u times, zero, uh, u times w is not 0 is if there's an edge uw. And u times the sum of all the vertices below it is 0. And that's it. So for example, let's return to our smallest minimal uh, example, um, non-trivial example, b2. What would we have here if we wanted to construct b gamma for this? Well, we can label our vertices. And keep in mind, the vertices are now the generators of b gamma. The b's can't precede anything, because there's nothing below the b's anymore, because we've removed that minimal vertex. The a's, well, we have a b1 plus b2 is 0. And we have a times a is 0. So b times anything is 0, a times a is 0, and a times b1 plus b2 is 0. And for something so short like this, we can just count this directly in order to find the Hilbert series. There can't be any words of length 3. Why not? Well, if you start with B, you're in trouble. If you start with A, then you have to follow up with a B. And no matter which B you follow up with, well, you're in trouble. You can't get to any words of length 3. And there's just going to be one word of length 2, because AB1 happens to be equal to negative AB2. So there's just one word of length 2. And how do we find the words of length 1? Well, that's the easiest part. That's just our generators. So we get 1 plus 3t plus t squared. And this should look kind of familiar. This is almost the Hilbert series of A gamma. What is it? Well, it's 1 over the Hilbert series of A gamma, where t is replaced with negative t. And this is actually a very special property, which we're going to call numerical causality. Um, so whenever you have an algebra, and the dual of that algebra 
Whenever the dual of that algebra is Hilbert series is given by 1 over the Hilbert series of the algebra, where t is replaced with negative t, we call that algebra numerically causal. And this comes from the definition of causality, which comes from homological algebra. However, there's also a combinatorial definition of causality as well, and it involves a certain lattice being distributed. So suppose we have a quadratic algebra with generator space V and relation space R. 